Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the prediction problem in repeated games. Last lecture's Folk Theorem instructed us that equilibria are abundant in repeated games. What we're going to see today is that as a consequence of one of these Folk Theorems, it is very difficult for us to predict what individuals will do when they sit down to play one of these repeated games. But before we get there, a quick methodological note. Individuals use game theory by and large for one of two reasons. One reason is to find optimal strategies, and the other reason is to predict and explain phenomenon. If you're a game theorist in that first category, you would probably be a mathematical or algorithmic game theorist interested in some really complex mathematical problems and how to solve them. Or you might be someone who is doing some sort of business consulting and using game theory to get at some sort of business question. If you're a game theorist that is in the second category, well, you're like me, you're a social scientist, and you're interested in using game theory to be able to logically deduct theories of strategic behavior in the real world. If you fall into this first category, you probably think that Folk Theorem is really awesome. After all, there are a lot of games that have a singular, unique, optimal strategy, an optimal equilibrium for the players to play. And even if you're in a situation like a stag hunt or a battle of the sexes, maybe there are a few more. But the bottom line is that unless you get into some sort of weird circumstances, there are only so many equilibria, usually. But when you get into this repeated games context, you see that there's an explosion of more equilibria out there. And that might be pretty neat to you if you're interested in finding optimal strategies to discover that the set of potentially optimal strategies, those equilibria out there, to see that it's quite huge, that might be pretty remarkable for you. But if you're a social scientist like myself, Folk Theorem really hurts you because this predicting and explaining phenomenon, which is one of the purposes of using game theory, it really doesn't work out very well for you, at least in these repeated games. So here's an unfortunate result I'm going to give you if you're someone who's interested in conducting social science. Consider any finite stream of outcomes. For a sufficiently high delta in a repeated games context, those outcomes occur in a subgame perfect equilibria. So think about any sort of repeated game. We're going to play it today, we're going to play it tomorrow, we're going to play it the next day all throughout time. Think about any set of outcomes that occur sequentially in that game. I can show you that there's an equilibria out there that allows the players to play those particular outcomes, strategies that lead to those outcomes that you told me. I can actually illustrate this with the repeated prisoner's dilemma. For example, let's see. Imagine that we had a set of outcomes that looked like this. In the first period, we both cooperate. In the second period, we both defect. In the third period, we both defect. In the fourth period, I defect and you cooperate. In the fifth period, we both cooperate. In the sixth period, we both cooperate. In the seventh period, I defect and you cooperate. In the eighth period, you cooperate and I defect. That's a finite stream of outcomes. The type of equilibria that is going to support it will look something like this. You're going to do those outcomes that I just described for the end periods, the first end periods of the game. And then after those end periods have been completed, you will cooperate in all periods. And the same thing is going to go on for the other player. The other player will do the exact same thing. For the first end periods, they will play the strategies prescribed in the set of outcomes that we want to develop over those first end periods. And then they're going to cooperate thereafter. And if anyone ever deviates, whether we're going through the first end periods or through the cooperative periods after that nth period has concluded, then you defect forever. So this looks a lot like a Grim Trigger strategy. Grim Trigger, as you'll recall, in a classic sense, has everyone cooperate up front, and then if anyone ever deviates from that, then you defect forever. This is generalizing that to some degree, because instead of having us cooperate in every single period, we're doing goodness knows what through the first end periods before we adopt a more classic Grim Trigger strategy. Why does this work out? Why can this be sustained in an equilibrium? Well, we know that the threat to punish if anyone ever deviates is credible. That's because if you shift to a mutual defection, well... We know that's an equilibrium, so it's a credible threat to make. We also know that after the first end periods have concluded, 
that it's an equilibrium for sufficiently high discount factors to play that cooperate, cooperate, cooperate in every period and threatens an effect if anyone ever alters that outcome. Instead of reaching a cooperative outcome, they defect at some point. And the reason that we know that this is going to be an equilibrium after the first end periods is because that is a grim trigger strategy in the classic sense. So we know that that works out. The only remaining question is, would someone want to deviate in one of those first end periods? And you can see that for a sufficiently large discount factor, that's not going to be true. Quick reminder of what the payoffs that we're looking at in this repeated prisoner's dilemma for this unit. There you go. Quick reminder has now been completed. Let me explain to you the intuition for why you can sustain an equilibrium like this. This is the inequality to check whether you have a profitable deviation. On the left is what your payoff is if you continue these strategies. On the right is what you would get if you were to try to change that, if you were to deviate. So as long as this inequality holds, as long as what you're doing right now, following those strategies, generates at least as good of a payoff as your alternative, you would be perfectly happy to continue with this, which is exactly what you would need for an equilibrium. Let's break this down piece by piece. Let's first start with what's going on on the left-hand side of the inequality. This is what you're getting if you continue with these strategies. This has two component parts. The second part is a little bit more straightforward. This is your set payoff that you get if after you've completed those first few periods, the first n periods of doing whatever it is that we have called for in this equilibrium, after that point, you get a payoff of three in every future period. Because in this stage, you're going through mutual cooperation in every single period. So you get a payoff of three in that first period in the second stage, and then a three in the next period after that, and so forth. So that's the second half of the left-hand side of the inequality. The first half is a little bit more complicated. The first half is taking into account what is your worst possible outcome if you were to follow through on whatever those equilibrium strategies are. That's a one in the first stage, a one in the second stage, a one in the third stage, all the way through the nth stage. Now, you might actually get a payoff that's a little bit better than this. After all, in order for you to get a one in each of these stages, it would have to be the case that you cooperate in every single period while your opponent defects. However, if you were willing to go through with this strategy, even in this worst possible case, you would be willing to go through this strategy if you were to get a little bit of a better payoff. Because it could be the case that you're not having a situation where the opponent is defecting on you and you're cooperating every single stage. You could be getting a better payoff. But if you're willing to continue through this strategy, even in the worst case scenario, of course you would be willing to follow through on this if the conditions were a little bit rosier for you and you'd be getting a better payoff through those first end periods. On the right hand side of the inequality, we have your best possible outcome if you were to try to deviate. And that is for you to get a payoff of four in the period that you deviate, and then a payoff of two for the rest of time. We know where the four is coming from. That's the best possible payoff you can receive in one period. And you should recall that the payoff of two for the rest of single rest of time, I should say, is coming from the fact that if anyone ever breaks from the strategies that I've proposed in equilibrium, the trigger is, well, triggered, and we have mutual defection from that point forward. So why is it the case that this inequality holds for sufficiently large delta? And remember, the theorem that I just gave you said that this is going to be an equilibrium as long as delta is sufficiently high. Well, the intuition is pretty straightforward. When delta is close to 1, that's like saying every single period is equally important to me. Whether we're talking about period 1 or period 300, when delta is close to 1, the payoffs for those periods look very, very similar. And so if we have a finite length of time, say n periods, where we're doing something random, whatever it is that has been called for in equilibrium, the payoffs that are generated over those first n periods are essentially irrelevant compared to the periods n plus 1 through infinity. Because the periods n plus 1 through infinity are much, much larger, in fact, they're infinitely larger than the first n periods, because n is finite, whereas n plus 1 through infinity is infinite. Well, notice that in these second stage of payoffs, after you've gone through the first n stages and you're in stage n plus 1, you're receiving payoffs of 3. 
And those payoffs of three th from N plus one through the rest of time are going to be better for you than getting a payoff of two in each of those stages. And again, because these periods are lasting infinitely long, they are much more important as long as delta is sufficiently high than whatever is going on initially. So as long as you're sufficiently patient, it doesn't matter if you're getting a payoff of one in the first few stages, or even if the N is a thousand stages, it doesn't matter that you're getting a payoff of one for the first thousand stages, if it means that eventually you'll start getting these payoffs of three from then until the end of time, rather than the payoffs of two. So you would be willing to follow through on this. And in fact, you can do a lot of algebra and show that there's going to be a sufficiently large dis discount factor that will make sure that this inequality is true. But the algebra isn't what's important. What's important is the consequence of what I just said, the bite of what I just said. If you're a social scientist, then the purpose of equilibrium is to predict and explain outcomes. Yet the result tells us that subgame perfect equilibrium predicts and explains everything. Everything. Imagine that you're a social scientist and you care about studying some sort of strategic interaction between a couple of actors that recurs through time. One way you might get at this is to collect data. Go out and see what the individuals have done in this strategic interaction. If you do that, you'll come back with a finite length data sample. It has to be finite. There's not enough time out there and not enough notepad for you to be able to collect an infinite length sample. But what we have from earlier is that whatever it is that you put down in your pad, I don't need to see it. You don't even need to go out and do it. You will know that there is going to be a subgame perfect equilibrium out there that matches whatever it is that you find. And that's a big problem. Subgame perfect equilibrium is essentially predicting and explaining everything here. But if you do that, you're predicting and explaining nothing. It's like if I came up to you and I said, in the 2016 US presidential election, Sanders, Clinton, or Trump will become the president. That's factually true, and yet it doesn't really narrow your expectations. You knew that already. I was naming the three candidates that are still really in the race, so of course it has to be one of them. We know it's not going to be anyone else. That doesn't tell you anything that you didn't already know, and that's a big problem. To be clear, this is not an indictment on game theory. This is something that's just factually true. This is a result that game theory has told us that we might not have known had we not had these tools available for us to study the strategic scenarios of actors playing games throughout time. But it is something that we need to be cognizant of. We need to know that when we're facing these repeated game situations, it might be the case that we can't really pin down very easily what's going to happen, and that the set of outcomes that we could expect to occur is fairly broad. And that's all due to that nasty folk theorem. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.